And I'm also going to um, share my desktop and talk about the plan. Okay, so you should be able to see. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, let me tell you the plan today. First thing, this is the very last webinar of the course. Um, we're in week 11 right now. And some of you a week from now will be totally done because if you finished your um, the final exam, you know, then you're done with the class. So that's why there's no reason to have a webinar next week because there's nothing to prepare for, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, so this is our very last webinar. And, you know, hopefully you um, were able to, you know, get some good takeaways out of these webinars as we've been going. Not all online classes have webinars, but um, I'm a strong believer in making sure that we can have interactivity and all that because I think it helps instead of just everything being static as an online class. So just let you know, um, but we are done. So um, today, what we're going to talk about, um, it's actually going to be probably a shorter webinar because um, there's less to talk about. Um, and part, there's, a, there's a few reasons for that. One is that what big thing is due on Sunday, absolutely due on Sunday. Hopefully you all know. Yeah, the project. Okay, so I want to make sure that, you know, so this week should be a kind of a lighter week. One is that Project 2 is due on Sunday. And the other one, especially if you're, and not all of you are, but if you were a full-time Lake Tahoe Community College student, then you got your finals to start working on for next week in all of your classes. So I try not to, you know, put too much work this week other than the project. And the hope, which isn't always true, but the hope is that you've got lots of progress on your project so that, you know, by now, you know, there's not too much left to do. That's always the hope. Um, so what we are going to do, doesn't mean we're not going to do anything we're going to do, and this might mean nothing to you right now, is ANOVA. Okay. And I will let you know, ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. But the title will mean like have no meaning when you actually learn about it, because what we're going to be doing is not looking at variance. <laughs> so I apologize. I, I didn't make the title. It's just what everyone uses. So I have to make sure I use the same thing. And that is that um, we're going to be looking at, at to see if means are all the same. It's not about variance as being the same. It's about means being the same. So just let you know, there's some deep math behind that has variance in it that we never do because we just use a calculator. Just let you know. So, but if you want to, you know, be a, ma a math major or statistics major sometime, then then you might look at it and see variance. We'll look at the requirements to be able to actually conduct the ANOVA study. So it turns out that. By the end of this week, you're going to feel like you have a good handle on ANOVA, but I want to give you a heads up, you won't have a good handle on ANOVA. It'll just feel like it. <laughs> and that's because the requirements are quite deep. And to know that you have the requirements is actually pretty tough. All I want you to make sure is you know what the requirements are, okay? But you don't have to know all the details on it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of finish off with a chat about project two, because project two is a, you know, it's a big deal and it's a big part of the course. And just let you know that, um, you know, it's part of your grade, but also, um, which I'm, there's not much to chat about, but we're in week 11, which means this week you don't have a regular exam, but next week you do. Because next week is week 12 and it's the finals week. And uh, unlike everything, pretty much everything you've ever had to do in this class when it comes to exams and assignments, um, this one will be due on next Wednesday. So eight days from today, today is Tuesday for those watching this as a YouTube or whatever. Um, so it will be due on Wednesday night of finals. Um, you can do it earlier, that's fine. But um, it's one of those where don't ask for extensions because with the final, you take your final and then I send the grades to the college. And if you wanted a couple of days extensions, it's too late because I've already like sent in the grades. So make sure that you can get that one done on time. It's the one time you can't get an extension for. 
So uh, very important. Um, is it the same type of exam was a question. And the answer is yes. Okay. So what I have done is hopefully you've been noticing is that like about half the exam is, re is review of the stuff that happened, not the current week or the week before, but before that. And the other half is the newer stuff. So that's the same, but now the, the review is pretty much everything. So, you know, it's just more review stuff, if that makes sense. But there is a higher focus on the chapter um, this week and last week. You said this week's material, but it's actually last week's material too. So it's always on the, you know, since, or sorry, this week, I guess it is just this week. Yeah, so there's a higher focus on ANOVA than there is on the rest of the stuff. But the rest of the stuff is still, you know, all fair game. And the way I do it, and hopefully you're getting used to it, is I just take basically everything that you've had and it randomly grabs some problems. Everyone gets different problems. Okay, so, you know, what you get is totally random, if that makes sense. Have you noticed that, the randomness? Or does it feel like it's random? You know, yeah, I mean, you only get to see one exam, but if you compare each other's exams, you're going to realize you have different questions. And I don't even know what questions you're going to get <laughs> because it's all randomly done by a computer, you know, random number generator thing. And hopefully you understand randomness because that's a big part of statistics. Okay. Um, so we are going to chat. We're going to spend the last part of this webinar chatting about project two, kind of last last chance, I wouldn't say last chance questions, but last chance webinar questions this is our last webinar. Um, and I can go over any questions you guys might have about project two and always happy to answer. And I want to give you a big heads up and I apologize for this, um, but there's nothing I can do. But um, I don't know if you know, but I'm on the statewide mathematics board for community colleges for Northern California. And um, one of our big things is we have a conference every year, and this is our first time in three years that we've been able to have it face to face because of COVID. And it's this weekend. So I will be mostly offline um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I want to give you a heads up on that. I'll be checking my email like once a day, but you're not going to, I'm not going to be able to get back to you like right away, like I usually do. And that's because I'm I'm one of the I'm I'm actually you might guess I'm not sure, but I'm the AV specialist for the conference, so I'm going to help everyone with their computer problems, <laughs> and I got to be there. So I'm not going to be checking my email. I'm not going to be checking the um, the posts for the Q and A and the discussion uh, once a day maybe, but not like you know every few hours. So I want to give you a heads up that you know that I'm not going to be around much on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. And actually Thursday evening either, because that's when I'm driving. That's my start of the driving. I will be checking my email early in the morning, you know, shortly each day um, because I wake up really early and nothing ever starts that early. So I can be able to answer questions, but I, but otherwise I'm not going to be able to, you know, do much communication with you all. So I apologize. But um, the good news is Braulio is still going to be around, so he can help you out <laughs> and he'll have more hours. But again, there's nothing much I can do. Um, I'm a big believer in making sure that California, not, not just my class, but all of California gets good mathematics and, and statistics. So I work to do that. Um, so that's just a, a heads up. And um, that's the best I can do. Friday, I will not even have office hours because I will be on the road to Monterey on Friday. So I won't even be in office hours on Friday. So just let you know that that's, you know, the one off, I, I don't have a lot of missed office hours, but that's one. Um, another piece in terms of my schedule, it may not matter to you guys, but just in case my, and I'll post it on the um, announcements, but my office hours for Monday um, will be not, in the normal hours. Normally I have it at 10 o'clock, but I'm actually giving a final exam at 10. Our final exam schedule is different than teaching schedule. And I have no ability to change that. So I will have my office hours at nine o'clock a.m. Um, on Monday and not at 10 o'clock a.m. on Monday. So if you need to talk to me on office hours, um, 
that's how you can talk to me. I'll be checking my email because I'll be giving a final. I'll have my computer in front of me, but I won't be able to talk. I won't be on Zoom because my students don't want to hear me talking to you while they're taking their final. And hopefully you understand that. So it'll have an earlier office hour that day. Okay. And that's all, you know, cross our fingers that I'll be able to because we're expecting a big snowstorm. <laughs> and if I have no internet, then I don't have any ability to talk to you guys. <laughs> hopefully you understand that. But hopefully, hopefully we'll get internet. <laughs> Okay. Um, are there any questions about anything? This is your chance. And as always, um, I'm happy to answer questions if you put in the chat box or, or say them. Um, and throughout the whole webinar, I'm happy to answer questions too. But I just want to let you know that um, this is a good time to ask questions if you have them. Okay. Oh, one more heads up. The discussion post assignment due this week. If you don't get a 10 out of 10, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It meant that you didn't put you didn't post on time. Okay. It's the easiest discussion assignment, I think, at least I think, and I think you'll agree of the whole quarter. <laughs> okay. It doesn't involve statistics. So, um, but you do have to do it. And it's easy. So that's something you should do. And this is one where you can actually reply to everyone if you want. Okay. So remember the very first one and the very last one are the ones you can reply to lots because it's more of a goodbye kind of thing. Okay. Any questions? And if there aren't, I can um, pop up a Nova. So I want to do, and it's always helpful anyway, to do a little review of everything. Um, especially hypothesis testing, which is what uh, we're doing today. And that is we started out with hypothesis testing for a single population mean. So like one survey question, it was a it was a number answer, and we were able to do a hypothesis test. Then we talked about hypothesis test for a single population proportion. So same idea, one survey question, but it was yes, no question. Then we moved on to what if we had two questions or two groups and we wanted to compare them. And that's what you have to do for your project, by the way, with quantitative data. Then we had dependent and independent samples. Okay. And then we also looked at two groups and we wanted to compare when we had a yes, no question. Both were yes, no questions. We looked at comparing two proportions. And then we moved on, if you remember, after that, yeah, the project is all about chapter 10. And remember, it's the quantitative part of chapter 10. It should not be a yes, no survey question. So it's really a chapter 10 project. OK. So um, then we moved on after that from chapter 10. And we moved to chapter 11, which was what happens when you have a qualitative, not yes, no survey question, and you wanted to look at it. And that was the whole chi-squared stuff, right? And we looked at, you know, is the distribution of favorite colors, a, you know, uniform, for example, or something like that. Um, so that was for the qualitative survey questions. And then we moved on to, if you remember, chapter 12 was regression analysis. And then we wanted to find out if there was a correlation between, between two quantitative things. What haven't we done yet? What don't we know how to do a hypothesis test of? There's not too much left. There's a few, but there's one that we'll do. And I'm... Anyone can think about something we haven't done yet that we don't know how to do a hypothesis test of because we haven't done it. Okay, and there's more than one, by the way, but there's one left that we do, and that's today. Yeah, um, so comparison of variance, it turns out, um, we have not done that. And I will let you know we will not do that. And I don't know, I don't know if you were listening carefully. I said it was called analysis of variance, but that's not what we do. <laughs> it's just a, it's a it, it's like a tricky title, ANOVA, even though it's not analysis of variance. Uh, comparison of variance actually I used to teach in my class, um, but there was just too much, and it wasn't used. I it just isn't used all that much in the real world, so I decided to drop that. So we won't do a comparison of variance. And I also, as I mentioned, I'm going to this conference this weekend. One of the things I do at conferences is I find out what everyone's doing. And if no one else is doing it, I don't do it either. 
because I don't want to torture you to, you know, have a lot of things that no one's doing. So we don't do comparison of variance. Any th other thoughts? I don't see y'all jumping in. <laughs> okay. What if, what if instead of two groups, what if we had more than two groups? Like, let's say we wanted to look at, um, I don't know, how about the, um, how about something like the, um, the math, the, the GPA for the different majors on campus? Uh, multiple regression analysis, um, I, as I mentioned last week, that's way too hard for this class. That's actually a brutal subject. I mean, I know about it, but that one we don't do. But what if, what if we wanted to look at GPAs for all the different majors on campus? Have we done that yet? Have we, done, have we been able to evaluate to see if, if GPA for all the different majors is the same or not? Have we, do we have a hypothesis test that we've learned how to do that? You know, and there's lots of majors. There's, at least at our campus, there's a math major, there's a psychology major, there's a business major, there's um, an English, I think there might be an English major, an art major, there's all kinds of majors. And do they all have the same GPAs or not? Does that make sense? So we know how to compare two different means, but we haven't gotten into saying, well, what if we had multiple things, more than two, and see if the means are the same. Okay, so we, that's what we want to look at. Okay, so we want to look at when there's more than two groups to see if the means are all the same or not. Does that make sense? And that's what ANOVA is going to be about. Okay, again, it's easier to say ANOVA and not even know what it stands for because then you won't get tricked into thinking it's all about um, variance, which it isn't. It's really all about the means. Okay. When you get into the mathematical detail, which we won't in our class, um, you'll see variance, but we're not going to do that. Okay. But do you see why that could be important? Okay. Or maybe you might want to say, um, how about the age of people based on political affiliation? Right. And you want to look at the different political parties. So we have the Democrats, the Republicans, the Independents, the Green Party, right? There might even be some more. And do they all do they have the same age? Okay, average age. Does that make sense? And we don't know how to do that yet. And one thing you could do is you can say, well, you can you can do a you know Democrat versus Republican, Democrat versus the um, Independent, Independent versus Republican, Green Party versus Democrat. And you can check them all and say, hey, are any of those different? And if one of them's different, we say there's a difference. What's wrong with that? Any thoughts? It sounds good, right? Could we know how to do a, a comparing to two different population means using um, chapter 10 stuff? But this doesn't work in the case that I'm talking about when you have multiple groups, even if you do two at a time. You want to see the problem? Okay, it has to do with this. It has to do with the type one error. So the idea is that if you say we're going to let the level of significance be five percent. The problem is then there's a let's say a 5% chance of a type one error with every pair. And if there were a hundred pairs, then you're gonna get a type one error just about every time, right? One of the pairs is gonna have a type one error and you can say they're different. So that doesn't work. So it turns out just saying, let's just individually do each pair and see if there's a difference. And if any of them have a difference, it's different. That doesn't work because of the type one error issue. Any questions on that idea? Because if you do multiple experiments and you have a 5% type one error each time, and there are a whole lot of them, you can have a pretty high chance of a type one error. And that's not good. You don't want a high chance of a type one error. Okay, so 
let's talk about ANOVA. And here's what it's all about. So first thing is that ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. And I, um, again, I'm not the one that made this title or the abbreviation, but for some reason they chose the first two letters of analysis and the first letter of of and the first two letter of variance so that they can say ANOVA. Okay. I'd be okay with AOV, but they didn't want that. Okay. They being whoever chose this name. So everyone calls it ANOVA, even though it's kind of a weird abbreviation. Okay. And it's not a test to see if variances are the same or not. It's a test to see if several means are equal or not. Okay. So here's the part that's a little weird. In chapter nine and 10, when we did hypothesis testing, how many words were in H0 and H1 when you wrote down H0 and H1 officially? This is a really easy answer. For chapter nine and 10, how many words were there? Very easy answer. Do you remember? I know it's been a long time. Nobody remembers? Zero. There are no words. So remember that H naught for chapter nine was like mu equals five. Not in words and symbols. Right? And H1, mu greater than five in symbols. Okay. Or it could have been P equals 0.3 or P is less than 0.3. Do you remember that? And then we got to chapter 10, it was still all symbols. It was mu one equals mu two, or P one equals P two, or mu D equals zero. Do you remember that? Then we got to chapter 11. How many symbols were there in H naught and H one in chapter 11 after the colon? Well, I, I think we were able to use like a row, like row equals zero or row does not equal zero. Uh, that's so, chapter 12. Oh, <laughs> what was chapter 11? Chapter 11 was the uh, chi-squared. I thought that was chapter 10. No, chapter 10 was the um, difference between two means. So like your project or difference between two uh, proportions. Yeah, trust me on that one. <laughs> chapter 12 was regression analysis. So chapter 11, so if you don't remember, there were no symbols. It was all words, right? The distribution of this thing is the same as the distribution of this other thing. Do you remember that? Okay, or these two things are independent. It was a bunch of words. Do you remember that? Okay, now we're moving in chapter, by the way, chapter 12, we went back to symbols only. So now we're getting creative for chapter 13. Okay, and I actually did this I, from when I first started teaching, I did it in a different way and nobody got it right. And if no one gets it right, then I'm obviously doing something wrong. <laughs> so I changed it and now it works pretty well. I wouldn't say everyone gets it right, but now most people get it right. So H naught is that mu one equals mu two equals, sometimes it's mu three equals mu four equals mu five. All the means are the same. Does that make sense? Okay, um, and like I said, if you wanted to find out the mean, how about the mean, um, if you want to find out, let's say the mean high temperature in, let's say, uh, Mexico City, I want to pick something pretty far south, is the same spring, summer, winter, and fall. Then you would do mu S or mu spring equals mu Maybe mu, mu sp equals mu su equals mu f equals mu w because there's four seasons. Do you see that? And you'd write symbols. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so it's very important that H naught is going to be symbols. H1 is not. Okay, and this is something people don't realize. 
H1 means H0 is incorrect. Is that correct? Does that make sense? So what's wrong with just taking what I have in H1, but taking all these equal signs and making them not equal to? What's wrong with that? The requirement is that two or more, not yeah. all of them are not equal to each other. Right, because, because if say, let's say that uh, spring and winter have the same temperature, but fall's different, then they're not all the same. Do you see that? The, there's a couple of them that were equal, but not all were equal. So the problem is, is that symbolically, it's very hard to say that they're not all the same. Um, there is a way of doing it, but it turned out I, I tried and it never worked. Right? It uh, did about two, two years of that and I gave up. So now words are much easier. And the way you write it is at least two of the population means differ from each other. So in this case, if you're talking about seasons, for example, then you would say at least two of the population mean temperatures differ for two different seasons. Okay, or there's at least two seasons that have different population mean temperatures. Do you see how that works? Or if it was um, the GPAs for majors, you would say there are at least two majors that have different GPAs. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so um, the good news, by the way, is this week we're only doing one hypothesis test, one type of hypothesis test. And there's nothing else other than hypothesis test. We're not doing a confidence interval. Uh, it doesn't even make sense to do confidence intervals. So there's a, there's a lot less material. This chapter is much shorter than the rest of them. And there's not that much detail. And since hopefully you all understand hypothesis testing, because we've been doing it for weeks and weeks and weeks, that it's all going to be similar. Any questions on the idea of ANOVA? I'll do an example in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more first. All right. In the past, um, when we talked about means, again, when we have a when we have a bunch of mu's, that means quantitative variables. Then in the past, there were a few assumptions you had to have. Do you remember the assumptions to be able to do a, like say a hypothesis test for a population mean? There are a few things you had to assume, or you had to make sure that was true. We haven't done them in a little while, but. Wasn't there a sample quantity requirement like uh, 30 was, was it? Right. right. And the reason why you needed 30 is so that you could have a normal distribution. Right. So you had to have over 30 or a normal distribution. Okay. Does that make sense? So you have to assume you have a normal distribution for, you know, in chapter nine for the, the population in chapter 10 for for the two populations. Do you remember that? Okay. What are, and then what other assumptions? And this happened a big way in chapter one. That you can't do any statistics if you don't have this. And it was also in project one and project two. <laughs> but project two, I'm going to let you just assume, even though it's probably not true. Remember, you had to have a representative sample, no bias. Okay, you weren't just able to just ask your friends and say, I can trust that because they are my friends. <laughs> you know, and, and that'll tell you, you know, about GPAs or something like that. No. So you had to have a representative sample. Otherwise, you can't do any statistics if you have a sample that's not representative. Does that, hopefully, you're all on board with that one at this point is that if you have a bias sample, you should never publish anything, you know, and rely on it. Does that make sense? For project two, I'm allowing you to have a bias sample as long as you admit to it. Okay, but just to let you know, having a bias sample does not mean you should take project two and then publish it in some big journal. It just means I'm allowing it for the class. Do you see the difference? Okay, so 
let me go through and go through the requirements. It turns out ANOVA has even more. So the first one is all the sampling distributions are approximately normal. And we have learned that if your sample sizes are all over 30, you're good. If your sample sizes are not all over 30, then you better know they're normal. You better assume they're normal. Okay. To decide whether something's normal if it's under 30, by the way, there are ways of doing it, but I think I might have mentioned it a few weeks ago. It's too advanced for this class, so we're not going to do it. <laughs> is that clear? So I will let you know that there is more statistics to do after this class that you haven't learned yet. We can't do all statistics that exist because it's just too much for one class. So I apologize if I can't do everything. Um, but there is a, something called, uh, I'll even tell you, it's a Kolmogorovsky and if I pronounce it, if I pronounce it wrong, sorry, it's a Kamigarovsky um, test for normality. And that's what you usually use to see if it's normal, but not in this class. Sound good? Okay, now comes a bunch more. <laughs> so here's some more requirements. Let me put on the same page. Okay. The standard deviations must be a, a equal or approximately equal. So you can't have one group vary a whole lot and the other very, not very much. It turns out ANOVA doesn't work for that. So if that's the case, then there's some other tests you can do, which again, I can only teach so much in this class. Okay. Um, simple random sampling, in other words, no bias. Okay, and that's that one's true of everything we do in this class, is that if you have bias, then you should never um, trust it. <laughs> um, the samples must be independent of each other. Okay, so this is for only for independent sampling and not dependent sampling. Does that make sense? So it, you usually don't ask a person four questions and look at the different, you look to see if their answers are the same. Um, you can't really do a no on that because they would be dependent, not independent. And then the samples were consistently taken. Okay, so that one, that one might provide need a little ex explanation. And this one, I actually, I think I mentioned it. Um, one of my first jobs ever. Do you remember what it was? I was the one that called people on called people on the phone and did surveys. And I think I told you I was 11 years old. <laughs> now my boss would go to jail. <laughs> but in those days, life, I'm old. So things are different then. Um, that'll never, that should never happen anymore. Um, and one of the things that would happen is sometimes is that there'd be maybe, you know, different people doing the surveying. And let's say you were doing a survey in, let's say you were doing one survey in California and maybe another survey in New York, another in Texas, another in Florida, and you're doing the surveys in every state. And you wanted to find out if the states differed. Then you gotta make sure that the people giving the surveys in each of the states are all doing it in the same way. Does that make sense? And the way you do that in the real world, and we used to do this, by the way, because I know I was 11 years old, so I believe it or not, I still remember it, <laughs> um, is we'd have a meeting. And the boss would tell us what we had to do and how we would ask the questions. And if there were follow-ups, we'd have to make sure that the follow-up questions were consistent so that everyone was doing the same thing of the people that were conducting the surveys. Okay, again, it doesn't sound, you know, when you write this down, it looks easy, but in the real world, there's actually a lot of work to do. Another example that would not work is let's say you wanted to look at um, something about the presidents of the United States. And let's say, you know, you looked at the, the last 10 presidents of the United States about something they did. And the one problem that you might have is that they were obviously presidents at different times. 
So you have to be very careful about something like that. Is it the time at which they were president might make some difference in the survey? Does that make sense? So that could be a problem. Sometimes not, sometimes it's a problem. So if you're doing something now and then you're doing something next year and then the year after, and you wanna compare the three years, that might be a problem if something changed in the years at which the way the survey was conducted, okay? And laws change in how you're allowed to conduct a survey. Even that could change. So, or another one, if you're doing the presidents and the last 10 presidents, well, there may be issues because 10 presidents ago, they didn't have cell phones. And that could change how you do some kind of surveys. Does that make sense? So these are the five main requirements that you have to have in order to conduct an ANOVA test. Any questions on this? Okay. And what I'm not going to have you do is do any decision on whether they actually happened. You just have to say that you just have to know these have to happen. Because like I said, to know things are normal, it's very difficult. You need some advanced statistics. Okay. To know you have simple random sampling or, you know, a representative sample with no bias. Um, we talked about it, but it's very difficult in the real world. Okay. So there's all kinds of things that are difficult. Um, the samples being independent, that's actually difficult also. So I will let you know that it'll feel like you understand everything about ANOVA, but you don't. Because <laughs> these are these are difficult pieces. Okay. The other thing that ANOVA does, if you look at H1 is it tells you at least two of the populations differ from each other. What ANOVA will not do is tell you which ones differ. All you get to find out is that at least two differ. You don't find out which ones are different from each other. So it might be there's only two that are different. It might be that they're all different from each other. It might be that these are different. These four are different from each other, but maybe this other one is the same as these as this one or something. Does that make sense? And ANOVA will not tell you which ones are different. Does that mean you think you can't ever find out which ones are different? No. What does it mean if you want to find out which ones are different? What does it mean you have to do? And this is what I'm going to say on the last day of class, which is today, for the last webinar of class. Should I tell you? It means you need to take another statistics class. <laughs> You need to take advanced statistics and you need to learn about Tukey analysis. <laughs> so I'm going to be throwing a lot of words at you. You don't have to know any of those words. But if you take an advanced statistics class, you'll learn about that. And you'll learn about ways of de deciding. So there are statistical ways of doing pretty much everything that you, you might be interested in. Someone's come up with it. But we are stopping at ANOVA. Okay, so just a heads up that you can do a lot more than just what ANOVA does. But that's what you would do in a next statistics class. Okay. So what I want to do is an example. And let me make this a little bigger because I think it's my spot might be small. That's probably better. Okay. All right. Suppose a study was done to analyze the racial differences for the distance in miles that people live from the nearest public library. Might be something you might be interested in studying, right? Okay. Um, the data from the study are shown below. And you can see we are looking at um, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and other. Okay. And I simplified things. You know, nowadays uh, you probably get more specific on what you meant in terms of races, but I wanted to keep it simple. So I'm just saying this. Um, and then, oh, by the way, if I say the word suppose, do you know what that means? When I say suppose a study was done? It's, wanna... it's imaginary. Yeah, so... I just want to give you a heads up. I totally made up these numbers. <laughs> okay, but you could, a study could be done. Okay, this is not project two. Project two is on chapter 10, not chapter 13, by the way. Um, but a study could be done. This would not be a hard study to do, actually. You know, you could definitely do a survey. And you'd ask them what their their um, um, what their race is, and you'd ask them how far they live from the nearest public library, and then you'd put in the numbers. Okay, so a study could definitely be done. And this fifteen means that the first person that was white that you asked 
lives 15 miles from the nearest public library. Okay. And I guess um, this would be me. I'm white and I live two miles from the nearest public library. <laughs> okay, my uh, two-ish, two or three, something like that, two and a half-ish. Okay, yeah, maybe three. Okay. Um, so you can see what these numbers are. You can see that this is a quantitative survey, right? Because everyone answering the survey is giving numbers. And we're looking to see with four different groups whether or not the they all have the same population need. Any questions on that? All right, so before you even do the test, we need to say, what are the assumptions you have to make? To perform an ANOVA test. Okay, and again, I told you you don't have to like get into all details, but I'm just gonna copy and paste because those are the assumptions we need to make for this test. Okay, and we can look at, uh, I didn't like numbering when I copied and pasted. So I'll do it this way. <laughs> there we go. And sorry about the format. There we go. Okay. So those are those are the assumptions on the list of ANOVA. And we could look at them and see, you know, are they even reasonable? All sampling distributions are possibly normal. By the way, are our sample sizes large enough to say they're normal by the central limit theorem? You better all know. Are the sample sizes large enough? Because if the sample size is large enough, you don't need to make the assumption. You just know it. What do you think? Yeah, the answer is absolutely not. The sample sizes for whites was six. Need to be over 30, right? Sample size for black was four. That's tiny, tiny. And Hispanic was six, and other was also four. Okay, so that means we absolutely have to assume the distributions are possibly normal. Okay, had the sample sizes all been over 30, you wouldn't have to make that assumption because you just know it from the central limit theorem. Okay, had the sample sizes, let's say, from whites and blacks been over 30, but Hispanics and others been not over 30, then we wouldn't have to assume it for whites and blacks, but we would have to assume for Hispanics and others. Any questions on that idea? Okay, all population standard deviations are equal. Is that something we know or is that something we have to assume? It's an assumption and by extension, we're also assuming that their variance is the same. Yeah, 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 that's the same. Yeah, because remember the variance is the square of the standard deviation. And if two numbers are the same, the squares are the same. And standard deviations are always positive, so it actually goes back and forth. So you could use state variance, you could use standard deviation. It doesn't matter that, that they're, they're equivalent. Um, but no, I mean, maybe you're experts on library distance. I'm not. I have no clue about the standard deviations of how far whites are from libraries versus blacks and their standard deviation. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, so that's a clear assumption. Okay. And again, if you want to not have to make the assumption, then you have to take another statistics class. <laughs> and you're going to have to do, you know, Kolmogorov's test and uh, so standard deviations. Sorry, you're going to have to do the test for standard deviations. And that's a whole different thing. Okay. So again, there's a little more, there's more details than I'm giving you in ANOVA because this is, we can't do everything. Okay. Simple random sampling, no bias. Okay, well, I didn't tell you anything about what the study was. There could be lots of bias. This could have been convenient sampling. So we better assume it because we don't know. Okay. Um, the samples are independent. Again, we were not told anything about it. So we're going to make, make sure we have to assume it. Independence is usually not that hard to do with this kind of study. 
Because if you just, you know, go out and ask a bunch of people, what's your race and how far do you live for the library? Then you'll get independence, actually, if that's all you did. Because they're, they're just not dependent from each other. Each person you ask. Okay. And then the samples were taken consistently. Again, I didn't tell you anything about this study. So we better assume it. Okay. In the real world, you try and make it happen. But since I didn't give you any information, we have to assume. Any questions on the assumptions? Okay. Then the next step is to show the details of the ANOVA step, study of ANOVA. All right. So H naught. So for H naught, it's again, we can go back. Mu one equals mu two equals dot 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 equals mu n. Well, in this case, we have four different populations. And the good news is they all start with a different letter, W, B, H, and O. So I'm going to use those. And I think, well, let me do that equation. Let's try it this way. I do have one question, and mm -hmm. it might be a little bit silly, but so since we're using like H, zero, H sub zero as the null hypothesis, is like the mm -hmm. first hypothesis, and H sub one is the alternative hypothesis, mm -hmm. why don't we start with like mu sub zero as the, the first uh, mean rather than mu sub one? Like um, mu, oh, well, let me, show you what, let me show you what I'm going to start with, and that's going to answer the question. OK. <laughs> so I'm going to have mu. I'm not going to start with mu sub zero or mu sub one. I'm going to start with mu sub w. <laughs> Do you see? That makes it easier, I guess. Equals. And then I'm going to write mu. Each time you have to go to mu. <laughs> Sub b. Does that make sense? So it's a good question. And here's how you deal with it in, you know, in an example. And mu. Sub. And then h. And then equals. Mu. Sub, oh. That makes sense? Okay, now your question here in general, why did I start with one instead of zero? So Joshua, you're definitely a computer programmer. <laughs> you're a programmer, aren't you? <laughs> I'm really bad with programming. <laughs> okay, because program. I'm a programmer too, by the way. Programmers always start at zero. <laughs> But yeah. the non-programmers tend to start at one. <laughs> so but again, that's not for this class, but just let you know that's you know kind of standard. Like, I've done Python, so I know like the indexing, like zero is the first of like the list. Exactly. Whatever. Computer programmers always start at zero. But the non-computer programmers almost always start at one. <laughs> just where you count. One, two, three, four. That's how you count. But computer programmers start at zero. And I will not get into the details of that because the, that doesn't work for our class. But for us, it's a lot easier to do mu sub w equals mu sub b equals mu sub h equals mu sub o, because that tells a story the best way. Do you agree? And again, what you want to do is tell the story. And I want to tell the story by saying mu w, you know, white, black, Hispanic, other. And that way you can see those and you know who's what. Okay, h1 is words. And that is, we can say that at least, or we could say, yeah, at least two of the population mean. And again, what we were looking at is distance from the library. Distances from the library, from the nearest library. differ by race. And I want to mention something else. There's another way you will see it in literature. Sometimes you will say race is a factor in distance from library.
you'll see both. So when you say race is a factor in the distance people live from the library, nearest library, that's the same thing as saying at least two of the population mean distances from the nearest library differ by race. So I just figure I should let you know, like if you, you know, read a, a psychology journal, they might say the word factor. That's what they mean. Okay, the name of the test. This should be obvious. What test are we going to do? ANOVA. That's all we're doing today. Yeah, it's ANOVA. So we're going to do the ANOVA test. OK, any questions on that? OK. Um, level significance, you would probably use 5% here, 0 0.05. Um, this is this is sociology, <laughs> right? Talk about race. That, that's a sociology thing. Sociology sociologists almost always use five percent. That's the standard. Okay, um, no one's going to die, you know, because of it. Um, it's more of it's just a sociology thing. Um, so five percent is probably the level of significance you'd use here. Now, test statistic. How do I find this test statistic? And maybe the p value also. How do I find it? Any guess? Yeah, we use a calculator. So I'm going to go to my calculator, and this should be really obvious. <laughs> Given this is our very last week of class, this is the last example. I think it's the actually the first calculator. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Random number generator. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's number 25, ANOVA. Again, I, 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 per, I, I designed this calculator for this class. So click on ANOVA. OK. And what this does is it says enter the data separated by commas, data 1, data 2, data 3, data 4, data 5, et cetera. And, um, and by the way, if we, we don't have that many, leave the rest blank. If you have more than eight, by the way, then you need to use a spreadsheet. This calculator won't work. Um, but this calculator will work for anything we do in this class. But I, I want to let you in the in the real world, sometimes you will have more than eight different groups. And then you use a spreadsheet program. And in fact, I believe it's been a while since I've looked at it. My um, spreadsheet program that you use for the projects, um, that can do this with more than eight. OK, so I'm going to go to data one. And I need to remind myself 15, 4, 11. Nine three two. Data two. Twelve one six six. Data three. Nine seventeen five. Fourteen seven one. And then data four, 18.11.28. Any questions on that? OK, so hopefully you're used to that, separating by commas. And then calculate. That's it. So something new that you haven't seen before is the statistic we use for this is not a normal distribution. It's not a T distribution. It's not uniform. It's not binomial. It's not chi-squared. It's F. <laughs> so again, the math is way too hard for this class to tell you what that really means. But it's a different distribution. It has a totally different shape. Um, you can go in the book and um, I think I even made a, um, yeah, I did. I made a little um, visualization. You can actually see the F with different degrees of freedom, which is kind of like different number of groups. And it'll show you the F. 
Um, but I'll let you look at that. Um, so it's a different distribution. It's none of the ones we've had before. And the math is completely brutal. So you don't have to do it. That was my job. Sound good? Okay. So our test statistic is this F. And I'll just grab the first four digits, 3339. And the p-value was about 0.8, OK? Any questions on using the calculator to get the test statistic and the p-value? OK, and just like before, the test statistic is the value on the uh, horizontal axis, and then um, the p-value is the area to the right of that, basically. Okay, or the probability of having something at least that extreme. Okay, now it's time for our conclusion. What do you think? What's the first few words of our conclusion? You should be used to this now. What's the first few words? There is statistically, yeah, insignificant evidence. This p-value is 0 0.8. I didn't even have to give you an alpha. P-value is 0.8 is always insignificant. Evidence to make a conclusion whether or not. And then the easiest thing to do Copy and paste. But then change that at to lowercase. That at least two of the population mean distances from the public library differ by race. Or if you want, you could say there is statistically insignificant evidence to make a conclusion whether or not race is a factor in the distance people live from the nearest library. I, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So for this test, does the number of does the amount of data you enter into the calculator affect the p-value? Like, if there's more data, will it give, tend to give a lower p-value? So what it does, and this is for the whole class, not just for ANOVA, is there's something called the law of large numbers. What that says is that if you do a very large sample, um, given that you have all the good requirements, so no bias, obviously. So if you have a very large sample, then you're very likely to show the truth. So if the distance from the library has nothing to do with race, then you're going to have a very large p-value if you had a very large sample size. If the distance from the library does have something to do with race, if race is a factor, then you're going to have a very small p-value. If your um, sample sizes are large. Does that make sense? So that's true in any of this to any any of the um, hypothesis tests that we've dealt with. Is the p-value is affected because truth will be shown with a large enough sample size, and that's called the law of large numbers. Does that make sense? Okay. And the shape of F changes a little bit, but that's less important. What's more important is that the truth will be shown. Does that make sense? So if you surveyed randomly a million people, you're going to find out. It's just going to work. And your p-value is going to tell you exactly what's right. Does that make sense? Okay, but if we randomly surveyed, you know, this small group with only four blacks and four others, Truth almost will never be shown. And you can never really trust the p-value. So then could it be the case that they're actually, it, it actually is true that the means are equal, but we just because we got such a small sample size that there's no way the test is going to ever show that it's true? Yeah, well, you never end up saying they're equal in a hypothesis. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or you only, equal, yeah. yeah, you only say you have no evidence to show they're 
not evil, right? Or you say that you have evidence to show at least two are different from each other. And a small sample size, when we have a big p-value, because with a small sample size, it might be because our sample size is small. And maybe two of these really are different from the public library. Or it might be that we were just, they were equal. And our p-value is big because they were equal. But you never know that when you have a small sample. Either could be true. Does that make sense? Which is why... And I want to double, I want to mention this again. This statement is another way of saying we know nothing. It's a very fancy way of saying we know nothing. Do you see? Statistically insignificant evidence means we don't know anything. And that's why when you have statistically insignificant evidence, usually you don't publish. Because nobody wants you, no, no one wants a publication that basically says, I don't know anything. You see? <laughs> but the, you know, good question. And that's a good last question for the last um, example. I don't need to do more than one example because they all are similar. Okay. If we had a small p value, if this was say 0 0.08, let's say 0 0.08 instead of 8, what two letters would be gone? Actually, and maybe a couple little other changes, but two main letters. If the p-value is really small, and hopefully you're all used to this by now. Yeah, yeah, the insignificant would just be significant. And at the end, you wouldn't say whether or not, you would just say that, at least two. You could say that for this too, but I like the whether or not, because that really tells you you really don't know anything. <laughs> Any questions at all on ANOVA? Any questions? Okay, as I mentioned, um, and uh, hopefully you agree, um, there's less content, do you agree, than normal weeks? Yeah, so this is the last content actually, not just of the week, but of the class. Okay, there is no more statistics to do in this entire course. Um, you know, you in terms of new stuff, you're still going to have to do the assignment on chapter 13. You still have a project, you have an exam, okay? Um, but in terms of new content, this is it. Um, I do want to, um, I think I've mentioned it before, but I want to double mention it again. Um, the class is over a couple of things. One, the class is over next week, and um. Wednesday is the last chance for anything to take place, okay, for you to get change of grade. So don't email me on Thursday, how can I change my grade now? And when I say Thursday, I don't mean this week, I mean the following week. So, you know, uh, nine days from now, it's over. And I'm a quick grader, so I will have it graded for sure by that Thursday, okay? Um, and maybe by Wednesday, but no, not Wednesday, because some people are going to be doing it late at night, I'll be sleeping. <laughs> but by that Thursday, I'll have it graded. Um, so I'll let you know, I will have it graded. Your grades will be in. I do want to give you a couple, a little heads up. Um, projects. So you, you turn in your project Sunday night. And there's a decent chance I'll have it graded on Monday. If not, definitely by Tuesday. Yeah. Um, hopefully you're used to it. I'm not a procrastinator. Do you figure that out? Right. You had your you had your assignments due last night at midnight. And when did I have them graded? <laughs> I don't know if you even looked. You might not after, been, right? You may not even been awake when they were graded. Because <laughs> some of them were graded at six in the morning or five thirty, I think was the earliest person graded. <laughs> yeah. So I I you know, you know, it'll never be long, but I will let you know that I will submit the grades to the college but the college takes about a week to process them. So your final, final grade that goes on your transcript, that may not go for, that may be a week. And that I have no ability to change. And hopefully you understand that, okay? But your, um, but your, your, you know, I'll know your grades, I'll have it submitted, but it doesn't mean the college will be able to have it processed. So if you need it proof for some kind of transfer agreement or something like that, it might be a week before you have that in your transcripts. Does that make sense? 
just let you know. I could tell you what a grade is, but for transcript processing, that usually takes a week for bureaucracy, you know how that is. Um, so just let you know that that's grades. I want to let you know another thing is that I'm not your I am not your formal instructor after Wednesday after a week from Wednesday, but I'm still here to help. So if you are getting a master's degree, for example, and maybe a year or two comes by, my email should still be the same. Cross my fingers, nothing happens to me. I'm still alive and all that. Um, then it, I'll be happy to take a look at your um, your master's thesis, for example, and or help you with some statistics that might involve that. Um, I'll be happy to do that. And But I want to let you know I'm going to be completely honest with you on it. I'm not going to say, oh, that's wonderful. Everything's perfect. You know, if you have a sample size under 30 or under 31, I'm going to say, yeah, this probably won't get published. This may You're not tell the good. college to reverse our grade. Yeah. And this has happened before. No, I won't change a grade. No, this is just to help you guys out. Um, yeah. So rough drafts. Uh, I'm about to talk about the project, but I want to I get over this part first and then we'll get to the project. Um, so the other thing is that if you finish graduate from college, but then need statistics for your business, I will also help you, but it's going to be different. And the difference is it's going to cost you money, but the money is not going to go to me. I want you to give money to a scholarship to the college. Okay. And whatever I would have charged had I, you know, done that. I will have you donate money to a scholarship. And we have some scholarships for that, actually, that have already happened, thousands of dollars. And I'll be happy to do that too. So just let you know. So if it's for your business, that's different, then there should be, you need to give money. And it's a tax deduction, <laughs> which is always good too. So just let you know in terms of, you know, after this class is over, that's kind of how it is. As a student, I'll help you forever. As a um, business person, I'll still help you forever, but I want money going into a scholarship. Sound good? To help other students. Okay. Um, and now the very last secret word of the entire class is thank you. Because I want to thank you for those of you here for coming and, you know, and being polite. We haven't had anyone that's like evil or anything like that. At least I haven't seen it. Um, so thank you for, you know, your work in the class. And thank you for, you know, being good students and good people. Um, so that is a secret word for, um, I guess it's words because there's two words on this one. <laughs> and that's the secret words for um, this particular, the last, the last secret word quiz of the quarter. So now it's time to talk about projects. So the first question about the project is, um, are we able to submit our rough draft tomorrow to get feedback? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, so the the rule is that uh, if you give it to the, I, I will give feedback first come first serve. So if you're the first one to send me your project, you'll be the first one to get feedback. If you're the last one, you'll be the last one to get feedback. And um, after 8 a.m. on Thursday, that's the absolute deadline to get feedback on your draft. So if you send me an email on um, you know, Thursday at 8.30 a.m., I'll send you an email back saying, sorry, it's too late. So for your feedback for your um, draft, as long as it's by 8 a.m. on Thursday, but earlier means that you get earlier feedback. Um, I do want to let you know, I also I teach face-to-face um, -face classes pretty much from um, 11 o'clock a.m. tomorrow till 2.30 p.m. And so you won't get any feedback during those hours because I'm teaching and hopefully you understand that. Um, but then after that, then I can read your email and then I'll, I'll take a look and, you know, and I'll send you lots of feedback like I did for project one. I will let you know if you don't send me your project draft for feedback, things usually don't go well. Okay, things don't go well. And, you know, very, there are very few A's given in my career of people who didn't. And it's not because I take off points. It's if you don't get my feedback, you don't find out how it needs to be improved upon. And then you end up sending me something that needs improvement and that doesn't get an A. Do you see? It needs a lot of improvement. 
Whereas if you send me your draft by you know Thursday at eight in the morning, I'll let you know what needs to be improved on, and then you can make those improvements and then get a good grade on it. Does that make sense? Okay, or occasionally, and hopefully this doesn't happen, is that your project idea didn't work at all. And my feedback is you need to start over. And I hope that doesn't happen. It does occasionally happen. And that's again, why you're um, really supposed to post on the project to discussion board, your idea so I can give you feedback way earlier about whether your project can work or not. Because does that, you know, if it's a disaster, you know, if all you did was ask a yes or no question, then that's a disaster. Does that make sense? Um, so this is a great time to ask questions about your project. And again, um, I asked you at the beginning, but if, you know, you want to be private at, yeah, at the end, I'll be stopping the recording and then you can still ask questions too. How many pages should the project be? That's a really good question too. I purposely don't have a, a, an exact page limit. And I don't, I do that because I've been a student too. I was a student for nine years. And when you have a page limit, you do everything you can to make sure you get that many pages without like caring whether you actually said anything meaningful. <laughs> like you'll do things like add extra spaces and things like that. And I don't want you doing that. Um, so I don't give a page limit. Um, I will tell you two pages will never be enough. Okay, there's a lot of writing. There's a lot of writing. Some things that have to be in the project, and I mentioned it when we did our, um, when I discussed the project um, weeks ago, and that is you have to have the two main columns for the spreadsheet. Do you remember that? So if you're doing independent samples, that's going to be the two columns on the independent samples. And if you're doing dependent samples, that's going to be the two columns on the dependent samples. I don't remember the column numbers, but but it, one says independent, one says dependent. And by the way, don't mess them up. Your you know your project might be independent, your project might be dependent. Make sure you get the right one. <laughs> okay, it's not like you know some tricky thing. And that's the kind of thing I'm here to help you. Um, and our tutor Braulio is also here to help you out. You know that that's a disaster if you get those wrong. Where are the spreadsheets? Okay, um, let me remind you again. It's the same spreadsheet as project one, by the way. So if you go to, I think get, I think there's a lot of places you can get there. One is syllabus, I think was there. I think it was towards the bottom, if I remember right, was it? There we go. Google Sheets um, statistics program. Yeah, it's also in the modules. It's in a lot of places actually. And that was one way. You could go to modules and click, and that'll get you another way. Um, so there's a lot. You could post on the Project 2 discussion forum if you still can't find it, and I'll give you the link there. Um, yeah, and then you're going to use the two VAR stats. That's really important, two VAR stats, because there's Project 2 now. Okay. And by the way, you'll notice it has everything else, too. And I do that just in case, for some reason, the calculator I made didn't work. I also created this before I created the other calculator. So originally, this is all we had for it on the computer. So notice we actually have ANOVA. But don't do that. Use two VAR stats. And if you already, by the way, if you already made a copy of it for project one, you don't need to make another copy. Okay, because you already you just open it up again. Okay, and go to two VAR stats. And see where it says uh, J and K uh, difference independent or N and O different uh, stats for dependent difference. One of e either this one or this one needs to be copied and pasted into your project. That has to show. Um, yeah, you're welcome to um, share your data. The what you can do, kind of the easiest might be, is to put the data into the um, into the spreadsheet, and then you share. And then if you go share. And you can copy the link and then share the link with me by email. Uh, but for like, say for the difference independent column, if we're doing a two tail test, like if we're doing a not equals or equals hypothesis test, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't be including the p-value for a right tailed or a left tailed test, right? Right, right. So I put these in, I had to make a decision and I put them all in that way, whichever one you want, you can look at. Got it. Thank you. So you're only going to look at, you're only going to use one of those. Don't use all three of them. 
But make sure you lose the right one. <laughs> if you're doing a two-tailed test, make sure you do the two-tailed. And I'll look at that when I grade it. Make sure you write the correct peak value down. And the idea is you'll have this copy and paste. I'll be able to see that you copy that you're citing the right of the, the correct p value. Oh, should we, we should still copy and paste like the right tail, left tail stuff. You're gonna go like this. Hit Control C. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna go into your document. Hit Control V, and that is part of your document. Do you see that? Understood. Okay. Or you're gonna go over here and Control C, <laughs> depending on what your project is. Does that make sense? So if your project is about independent data, use J and K. If your project's about dependent, use N and L. Does that make sense? You don't have to do the whole, all the different columns, but you should definitely have the statistics columns that you're citing. Does that make sense? And then make sure you change your confidence level to what confidence level you decided on. Does that make sense? So before you do control C, make sure you've changed it. And what you want to do, by the way, and this is something that, you know, I mentioned, I think, in the when I talked about project two, but let me remind you again, it's been some weeks, is you can you can go 95% and say, hey, here's 95%. It's negative, you know, 41 to 10. And say, well, that may not be very worthful for my, you know, useful for my client. It's way too wide. And my client may not be, may be okay with a 90% instead. And you can just turn that into 90%. Do you see that? So it's really easy to change. And in your, in your project discussion, you can talk about it. That makes sense? Okay. And um, just a warning, you probably don't, you probably don't, if it's in, if it's in red, you probably don't want to change any, don't go up here and change this stuff. <laughs> It'll give you a warning if you try. <laughs> And you you don't want to, because if you do, then you literally have changed the coding that I created to make it work. <laughs> okay, you can't change mine, but you can change your copy. <laughs> so that's just a note. Okay, um, and I want to note standard error. It's this standard error or this standard error that you're focusing on. You don't even have to talk about these guys. These aren't important. Okay, similarly at the confidence interval, it's either going to be these guys or these guys. Those are the confidence intervals that matter. You can mention these confidence intervals, but you don't need to because it's the confidence interval for the difference that matters for the project. Does that make sense? And then make sure that with the standard error, you look at the standard error when you're talking about just the standard error itself. You should reflect on the standard error when you're doing our hypothesis test in those paragraphs or pages. And you should reflect on the standard error when you're doing the confidence interval. Okay, does that make sense? So really there's three places you wanna reflect on it. And again, don't just write down the like one sentence description of in, looking at the p-value and think that's enough, okay? Make sure that's like a full, you know, several sentences on talking about the p-value and then incorporating how it works with the standard error and stuff like that, okay? Not the mathematics of it, but how it's going to be helpful for the client. How is your client going to reflect the p-value? Similarly with the confidence interval, how it, don't just state the confidence interval. Look at the lower bound. And what decisions will your client make from the lower bound of your confidence interval? Okay, and then what decisions might the client make for the upper bound of the client of the confidence interval? And then you can say, well, based on the confidence interval itself with the lower and the upper bound, if those decisions are completely different, then maybe your standard error is too big and you need it to be narrower. Does that make sense? On the other hand, if these guys are like really close to each other and you use 90%, well, maybe you shouldn't have used 90%. Maybe you should use 99%. And it's okay to widen them out a little bit. Does that make sense? If your client would be okay with it a little wider, because then, he, then your client could be more comfortable having a 99% confidence. Do you see that? 
Any questions on these little minute details? And all those details should be in your project. So basically, whenever I'm, I might be asking myself, should I explain this more? Just explain it more. Yeah, Before you can always explain it. more. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing you don't have to do is the mathematics. Yeah. Don't even try to, you know, explain how this p value is produced mathematically. Does that make sense? Because that's too much for this project. And it's, it's past the class. It's, a, it's above, above and beyond this course because you need calculus. Okay. And some of you would have no clue on the mathematics anyway, but don't, you don't need to throw calculus in. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, this mean difference is probably important. That's another statistic that's important. Okay. And if you're doing independent, then these two, oops, these two means might be important. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, almost all of you will have a zero for hypothesis test for the difference. So I don't even like that's in red because you're almost never gonna change that. Any questions? Any questions about the project? Again, this is this is a great time to ask project questions. If not, then I can. Um, uh, let's see the answer. No, is there an example essay? I purposely don't. I used to have an example, and then everyone just copied and pasted it, <laughs> and it was a disaster. <laughs> so I got rid of that. <laughs> okay, so I don't have an example essay. What I do have. That is if we go up to, and there's a few ways of finding this, by the way, project two, is I have these requirements that you should definitely read through. Okay, so I have all that. I have a rubric. Okay, so that, that should be helpful. Okay, and I also have, here's what I do have. I don't have an example essay, but see this feedback on project two drafts. I have example feedback that I've given in the past. So you know things to avoid. Does that make sense? So these are things that have happened in the past. So for example, you should choose the confidence level after looking at the standard confidence intervals, 90%, 95%, 99%. So if you haven't really discussed how why you chose your 95%, then you need to do that, okay? You should look at all three of them and then choose which one you want. Um, let's see, so when you give, when we give you our rough draft, if we follow all of your feedbacks, do you think there's a high chance we'll get an A? Um, so you mean get an A um, after following all my feedback? There's a pretty good chance of an A, but I'm not gonna guarantee it because <laughs> you might've followed it and been confused about it and followed it wrong, you know what I mean? <laughs> That could happen. And the only other disaster could happen is my feedback might be this project doesn't work at all. <laughs> so if you did some kind of, I don't know, if you did some kind of, uh, I don't know, chi-squared distribution thing with, with qualitative survey questions, then my feedback is you need to start over. <laughs> okay, and hopefully that doesn't happen. And, and that's why you, you know, hopefully you post it on your um, uh, project two discussion board so I can fix that right away. Um, but there are typically, I mean, not, I wouldn't say always, but if people follow all the feedback correctly in very strong depth, then A's usually happen, but not always, but usually happen. And again, tutors are good for that. I'm not going to be around much on the weekend. So you're going to have to get help from the tutor probably to decide if you follow the feedback correctly. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, this project to draft. I put 14 items that are like common things that I put in. These are these are actual feedback sentences I've given other people. Does that make sense? Okay, this doesn't mean this is the only feedback I've ever given, but these are like some of the major ones I've given. So the idea is hopefully with your draft, none of these <laughs> will be my feedback because you'll have already dealt with these. Does that make sense? 
And that should help. Other questions? Good questions, though. Other questions? Okay, if there aren't questions, I think I'm going to stop the share. And I want to thank you all for, um, you know, for your good support. And I'm going to stop the recording.